Chapter 23 Then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. All things therefore whatsoever they bid you, these do and observe. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Yea, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with their finger. But all So Matthew chapter 23 is filled with Jesus' scathing rebuke of the scribes and Pharisees, the hypocrites. Oh, uh, and if anybody else was saying this, I would think that maybe they were mixing in a little bit of exaggeration. But since Jesus is saying it, uh, you know it's true. But they just didn't, the scribes and Pharisees themselves didn't understand how evil they were perceived by God and Jesus. All their works they do to be seen of men, for they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the chief place at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues. And I think there are a lot of people today that have the same attitude, that they see themselves in a position of authority or respect uh, in the church today, and they love to be recognized by other people, and they love to uh, say long prayers and uh, to be viewed by people as religious and to be looked up at and admired and that is the absolute wrong attitude for Jesus it's all about humility and the salutations in the marketplaces and to be called of men rabbi but be not ye called rabbi for one is your teacher and all ye are brethren and this rabbi is being like a title, the title of teacher. Uh, now, that's not saying you couldn't try to teach somebody. I guess I'm trying to teach somebody here, uh, or at least providing an opportunity to discuss things and learn. But I would not want anybody to view me as an authority figure on teaching. I'm fallible. I'm human. I may understand some things, and I may misunderstand some things. But... We're equal. We're all equal. There's only one master teacher. And call no man your father on the earth, for one is your father, even he who is in heaven. And this is not talking about your physical daddy. This is talking about a religious title, like the Catholics and a lot of people have a religious title and they call them father this or father that. Uh, as if, I mean, it, that, that is so offensive. Uh, if you understand what they're saying, they're calling a human their spiritual father. When God is our spiritual father, why would you uplift a human to such a title as that? But people do it. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even the Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be humbled, and whosoever shall humble himself shall be exalted. So... If you have a choice, if I have a choice in whether or not I would rather exalt myself and put myself in a place of uh, pride and admiration for other humans and then let God bring me down low, or if I would humble myself and let God lift me up, I would much prefer for God to lift me up. So I need to work on humbling myself over and over uh, and let God be the one who does the exalting. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye shut the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye enter not in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering in to enter. Woe so, I don't think the scribes, well, in a way the scribes and the Pharisees would prevent people from getting in by their teaching and by their example, because if other people emulate what they do, then they do not, that is not the path that leads to heaven and salvation. Now, I don't think that they're deliberately trying to block people out of heaven. That's just the result of their behavior. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he has become so, ye make him twofold more a son of hell than yourselves. And that's because... Even though the scribes and Pharisees were trying to do what they thought was was right, 
they had a totally wrong attitude and wrong mindset. So whenever they would teach somebody and convert them to their way of doing things, their way of doing things uh, was bad and evil, even though they thought it was good. So anyone who learned of the Pharisees was in jeopardy of learning the wrong thing. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, that say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that hath sanctified the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gift that is upon it, he is a debtor. Ye blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? He therefore that sweareth by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. So I don't even understand why the scribes and Pharisees would even suppose that swearing by one thing is more important than swearing by another. Uh, it's completely off base. Uh, it's like the day people say, well, I swear on my mother's grave. Well, is that different than swearing on uh, a stranger's grave or a celebrity's grave? Uh, it's just foolishness. And he that sweareth by the temple sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that sweareth by the heaven sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye tithe mint and anise and cumin, and have left undone the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. But these ye ought to have done, and not to have left the other undone. So even under the old covenant, uh, justice, mercy, and faith were the weightier matters. Now there was a requirement to tithe uh, all of everything that you had. And they paid attention to tithing the most minuscule things that actually had no bearing on their life, really. Uh, and they completely ignored justice, mercy, and faith, which is the primary point. And that's not just a New Testament concept. That has always been uh, the underlying motivation for everything. Ye blind guides that strain out the gnat and swallow the camel... Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So, straining out a gnat, a tiny little bug, and swallowing a huge camel. And whenever you are looking at the perfect obedience to specific laws, you're, you're straining out a gnat. What you have to do is look at the underlying concept or reason behind everything you do which is love for your God and love for your fellow man everything you do is based on those two things on that hang all the law and the prophets both Old Testament and New Testament that's the motivation behind everything and uh, certainly obeying what you can read about the laws you can read about is a good thing but becoming uh, so focused on details will often lead you to miss the bigger picture. Hypocrites, for ye cleanse the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full from extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee. So extortion and excess. So the religious leaders were, I mean, even look at today, the church leaders uh, are some of the richest people in our societies and in our communities. They are some of the wealthiest and most well-to-do, nicest places to live. Uh, and I think when you see that, then people have lost sight of the big picture. Being a Christian is about humility and service and not about extortion and excess. So, And even the extortion, people make excuses saying you need to give to God when all they're really accomplishing is feeding their own lavish uh, desires and excesses. See, cleanse first the inside of the cup and of the platter, that the outside there may become clean also. 
Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which outwardly appear beautiful, but inwardly are full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but inwardly ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So when you can see the heart of a person instead of what they portray to the world, you see a totally different picture. And Jesus could see the heart of the scribes and Pharisees. He knew the motivation behind everything that they did. And so you wonder, well, how could Jesus be so uh, relentless or uh, uncaring about those who are blind? Uh, you know, the reason he said he spoke in parables, he says, to some it has been given to know the mystery, but to others it has not been given. And to those who were kicked out of the wedding feast, there was no sympathy for those that got kicked out of the wedding feast. And you just think about what Jesus sees when he sees your heart and when he sees everybody's heart. Does he owe anybody sympathy when there's wickedness inside of everybody? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and garnish the tombs of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we should not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye witness to yourselves that ye are sons of them that slew the prophets. Fill ye up, then, the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye offspring of vipers, how shall ye escape the judgment of hell? The obvious answer there is, <laughs> most likely, they won't. So I guess it's not that obvious because, I mean, there are some scribes and Pharisees. I think Paul was a, a Pharisee, so he could escape it. Uh, but how did he escape it? Did he escape it on his own, or did God give him grace and mercy and understanding? And that's what I would think. So how can you escape? It's only through the mercy and grace of God. Therefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them shall ye kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of Abel the righteous unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom ye slew between the sanctuary and the altar. So I, I just looked up Zechariah, son of Berechiah, and there is some, uh, I guess, challenging things here because the author of the book of Zechariah in the Bible is called Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. And he's not listed uh, as one who was killed in the sanctuary or between the sanctuary and the altar. Uh, there's another Zechariah that was. So some people claim that Jesus made a mistake here. And I hadn't looked into it uh, deeply, but I certainly don't think that there's a mistake here. It's worth looking into. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem. Okay. Jesus is saying this again. He started out, John the Baptist started out saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said the same thing when he was preaching. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he's already said, I believe in Matthew 16, uh, that all this was going to happen to this generation. And now in Matthew 23, he's saying the same thing. Now he's just been saying, woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And he said, how can you escape uh, hell? And he says, all these things will come upon this generation. And this generation most certainly means some of the people who are alive at the time he's speaking will see the fulfillment of the things that he's talking about. So we're not talking about a 2,000-year uh, fulfillment from the time Jesus is speaking. We're talking about within the next 50 years or so. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto her. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. So I think Jesus can gather his children anytime, whether they want to or not. But it's not his will to gather people who are opposed to being gathered up. Like the Pharisees were happy in their condition. 
they were satisfied and that's where they thought they wanted to be. And even when God sent Jesus and displayed all these miracles and fulfillment of prophecy, they refused to believe. So, uh, but Jesus did gather up the ones that he chose to gather, such as Paul, where he was a Pharisee. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth, till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So I wonder uh, if this is Jesus saying, you're going to know who I am and you're going to praise me for who I am. You're going to recognize that I'm the Son of God and you're going to see it happen. Now, even when Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, there were still many Pharisees who thought they did the right thing, who were proud of what they had done. Uh, so I'm not real sure exactly what this last phrase is talking about, but I would welcome your comments. That's Matthew chapter 23, the woe to the scribes and Pharisees.